Uh, my name is Armand Gertz. I'm a professor in the history of religions uh, at Aarhus University in Denmark. And uh, I started out uh, by uh, doing field work uh, with the Hopi Indians in, in Arizona and uh, became very much interested in um, the way that people behave and their religious behavior more than in the classical religious texts that I've been trained to do. Um, and um, these began raising some questions in my mind, uh, uh, how people actually act and behave and uh, how they uh, try to get around uh, some of their um, high principles and try to live their daily life mm -hmm. like the rest of us. So that's, that was my main interest. And I've always been interested in psychology and uh, interested in, in uh, brain and brain science. So um, when the cognitive revolution hit the study of religion, uh, which is my specialty, in 1990, um, I was ready. And uh, I spent the next 10 years um, trying to work out uh, a way of, of uh, dealing with uh, the new insights that were coming from the pioneers in the cognitive science of religion, like uh, uh, Lawson and Macaulay and Pascal Boyer and, and Harvey Whitehouse and people like that. And uh, we started a center. We found that, that um, the approach was uh, needed uh, input from the cultural sciences. It was, it was too, too much cognition and uh, too much uh, um, computer analogy of, of human cognition. And we were more on the, the social side and, and the cultural side of, of the equation. And so we uh, established a research um, group called the Religion, Cognition, and Culture Research Group, where we wanted to explore the relationship between um, cognition and culture and how religion plays in that uh, dynamic. And um, it picked up. I mean, people were interested in what we were doing. We got money from the university, and um, around 2000. And six, we were uh, going very well and having international conferences and um, people were, were coming to Aarhus and people were interested in, in, in studying with us and so on. And um, at the time, uh, similar things were happening in the other uh, departments at the University of Aarhus, uh, especially in uh, the neurosciences. And um, we, uh, got into contact with uh, our colleagues in the neurosciences and they were becoming interested in culture and, and social uh, dynamics and uh, realized that we're specialists in that and they're specialists on the brain so we um, uh, tried to uh, explore how um, we could um, have an interdisciplinary uh, cooperation. And one of my first PhD students in the cognitive science of religion uh, was very interested in the brain and learned how to um, how to work the machines, how to do brain scans, and uh, it was based on prayer. So we sat down with our neuroscientist uh, colleague and we worked out an experimental design where people were uh, asked to think prayers, uh, the Lord's Prayer, or think a personal prayer, or to think of a nursery rhyme, or to think of uh, wishes to Santa Claus. And then there was a, 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 a neutral condition. And what came out of it was some very interesting um, results where we noticed that when people were doing the Lord's Prayer, which is a, a very a sort of automatic, uh, rhythmic prayer, it's the same as when people were doing nursery rhymes. It was the same areas that were being used in the, the frontal, uh, prefrontal cortex. And um, when people were to um, uh, give their personal prayers, we found out that it was the areas of the brain that were activated that uh, uh, are ac activated when uh, we have social interaction with other human beings. And this started the whole thing. Then we could see there's some possibilities here. Now we'll be able to, to um, somehow map out what's going on in the brain in social interaction and what role religion might have in that. And um, by that time, I think around 2008 or so, uh, we were doing so well that, that um, and getting published in, in peer-reviewed journals and um, neuroscientists were interested and the, the newspapers were interested and the media were interested in our results. 
And, um, and so we were then recognized as a research unit, uh, the Religion, Cognition, and Cultural Research Unit, which we call RCC, uh, not the Roman Catholic Church, but um, RCC. We found out in, in our, uh, our studies that, that um, we need to take seriously both bottom-up approaches, in other words, what's going on in the brain, uh, what kind of cognitive mechanisms are at play, but also top-down uh, approaches. How does uh, religious belief, how does ideology, how do um, uh, cultural biases, uh, stereotypes and all that, how do they influence our cognition? Um, so we've been very open and we have people then who are, who are doing, as I mentioned, brain experiments, uh, people who are doing behavioral experiments. Um, there's uh, uh, one uh, particular uh, project that uh, is involved in pain, where people were actually uh, submitted to pain and asked to pray while they were being submitted to pain. And um, we came to some very interesting results that, that for religious people, um, the feeling of the intensity of the pain and the unpleasantness of the pain was reduced while they were praying to God. Whereas in the, um, the control group who didn't believe in, in, in God or, or, or were not religious, uh, it hurt no matter what. And so uh, we continued to say, well, what, what could be the, the mechanism behind this? Does it have something to do with dopamine, for example? Or is it the opioids that the brain produces to reduce uh, pain? And we got a doctor to help us out who uh, uh, blocked the production of dopamine while uh, people were praying. And um, the results were, were not as we had expected. Um, they resembled our earlier results where there was absolutely no attempt to interfere with uh, the, uh, uh, the neurotransmitters of the brain. Uh, so there's probably something else going on. And um, so the next phase is to move on and, 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 and try and uh, find that. On the top-down aspect, we've sent people out to do field work and to find out what, uh, what, pe what people do um, when they're moved by religious doctrines. Um, and uh, we've sent people to uh, uh, Mauritius, the, the island of Mauritius in the Indian Ocean, to study um, piercing rituals and firewalking. We've sent people to San Pedro in, in Spain uh, to uh, see what happens when, when people do uh, firewalking there. And we uh, strapped them up in instruments and, and measurements and uh, taken heartbeats and done interviews before and after um, concerning pain and so forth. And we've come to some very interesting results showing that um, exactly the top-down uh, function uh, of religion helps reduce the uh, experience of pain. For example, the piercing rituals in, uh, in the island of Mauritius where uh, Hindus um, uh, pierce themselves with, with, uh, with needles and, and, and uh, rods and hooks and uh, they, they walk on shoes with, with, with uh, um, um, uh, nails and, and um, it's for several kilometers and they, it's hot and it's really awful. And uh, people report that they um, are not aware of their uh, surroundings. Um, they don't really hear what people are saying to them. They feel that God is with them. Their God, Murgin, is the, uh, the one who uh, they are uh, uh, celebrating during the ritual. And uh, they're doing what he did when he was um, uh, a, young, a young person. And um, they, some even get into ecstasy. You can even see it. We've taken videos of, of uh, of uh, how they react uh, during the, the uh, ceremonial uh, um, phase of it. And, and you can see that people are gone. I mean, their, their eyes are very um, vague and, and wandering and uh, their body movements are, are very strange. Uh, some are swaying back and forth, some fall down, some people have to help them stand up again and so on, and they don't remember it. And all of, this, all of these experiences um, and results raise some questions for us uh, that are dominant in uh, the cognitive science of religion. Uh, for example, do rituals produce a collective 
um, effervescence, as we call it? Do, do people get into synchrony with each other and, and, and things like that? Um, so we also have people who, who um, are interested in the philosophical aspects of the CSR. We have the, the, uh, the clinical aspects, and then we have people doing uh, experimental work in the field. We also have people who are doing uh, behavioral studies in the lab um, with uh, computers and, and uh, uh, trying to see how people react, how long it takes for them to react, to recognize a, um, uh, an action as a ritual action or a non-ritual action. Um, and uh, we found out that uh, when it's a ritual action, people spend more time and focus more on the action and it becomes segmented much more than if it's something like just picking up a cup of tea or something. And um, we also have uh, uh, a person who's, who's doing computer simulations as well, where after he's done the studies of people and their reactions to, to behavior uh, that are either uh, ritual or non-ritual, um, then he's put it into a computer and he's uh, developed a little computer stick people and uh, trying to, to have them do the same kind of thing. And uh, the idea was that, that um, uh, the more that you know about a ritual, the easier it should be for you, the less attention that you should uh, focus on. But it turned out that, that humans don't act like that, but the computer did. The, the, the little robots, they um, acted the way they were supposed to. The more information they got, the easier it was for them to deal with uh, ritual. So we're missing something. So now what they're doing is going out and studying uh, people who do ritual to see uh, what's going on? Why, why, why don't humans act the way they're supposed to act? Um, and uh, then there's a historical aspect. Uh, we're very much interested in um, the new wave called cognitive historiography where uh, we, we are encouraging historians and uh, biblical uh, studies scholars to uh, try to apply cognitive and experimental approaches. And um, this um, is one, uh, an area that I'm particularly interested in is, uh, for example, the behavior of a, uh, the great Spanish mystic, um, Teresa of Avila, um, who was part of the uh, Counter-Reformation movement in Spain and uh, had some really, really extreme mystical experiences and at the same time has written two autobiographies uh, uh, with about 10 or 15 years um, uh, apart. Uh, they were taken by the Inquisition, uh, so she didn't have her first autobiography when she wrote her second autobiography. So already there we have some really good comparative material. She explains what she does to herself, how she's feeling, and what kind of experiences that she's had. And what we're going to do is try to code it and put it into a database and do some statistics and see uh, are, are there any correlations between uh, the time, how, she, how she's feeling, uh, the uh, uh, techniques she's using and the kind of experiences that she's had. And once we've got that, then we'll go back to the um, uh, cognitive science and, and uh, especially the neurosciences and neurobiology to see are there, are there correlations between what we know today about what happens when you, for example, use your body uh, when you kneel all day long um, or if you fast for days and days or if you do other stuff, uh, close yourself in in a dark room or, or things like that. Um, and we do have people who are actually doing that. We have a, a very talented uh, master's student who is um, um, putting people in, dep in a deprivation chamber, in other words, a chamber where there's no light, there's no sound, they, have, they put a helmet on them and the, the, uh, their eyes are, are, are covered, and um, they're primed that this helmet that they're wearing uh, has the ability of stimulating religious experiences. And um, it turns out that the control group, which are not religious, they have weird experiences, they're just not religious, whereas the religious group has religious experiences. And we've tried different kinds of religious people, uh, Christians and uh, spiritists and New Age people. And it turns out that the experiences that they get out of this uh, uh, deprivation uh, experiment um, are equal to what they believe in. So the spiritists see spirits, New Age people, they feel the energy, and um, 
uh, Christian people feel uh, the, 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 the Holy Spirit. And this again brings us back to the whole reason why we've established the RCC, to show how top-down uh, influences uh, cognition and, and how bottom-up uh, uh, goes into interaction with, with uh, social and, and cultural uh, contexts. The development of the cognitive science of religion has opened up uh, excellent possibilities for humanists, people in the humanities, to contribute to uh, major issues that have plagued human beings all of their throughout history. Uh, questions such as uh, uh, consciousness, what is consciousness, how does it work, um, what is the relationship between emotion and rationality? Uh, why are people religious? Uh, why hasn't religion disappeared through secularization? Um, and uh, how do people function as social beings? And, and things like that. All of those are very, very fundamental human questions that um, we've been asking ever since we've appeared uh, on the earth. And um, there have been many ideas about it, mostly by religious people and by philosophers. But as soon as the sciences began to develop in, in, uh, in, in the world, um, we began to develop um, methods to try to reduce these complex questions to very simple questions and see if we can accumulate um, a, a body of knowledge that is more or less supported empirically by uh, asking certain questions. And this, I think, is what's been happening now with uh, the cognitive science of religion because we've been borrowing techniques from the sciences, um, both the cognitive sciences but also neurobiology and medical sciences, uh, our colleagues in the, uh, the sciences are, are um, just by their very presence in our projects, are requiring us to think differently, to think experimentally, and to try to, to develop hypotheses that can be uh, tested empirically. And some of the results, not all, but some of the results can actually contribute to, um, for example, uh, medical problems like pain. So our project on pain is actually uh, supported by uh, the uh, Pain Research Center in, uh, at Aarhus University and Aarhus University Hospital. And it happens within the hospital context. And um, they firmly believe that um, if, if we can show that using certain techniques, for example, prayer, um, to reduce pain, um, this might be useful for doctors and, and their work and, and, and how they deal with their patients. This does not mean that we're, we're uh, trying to introduce religion into uh, the medical world or into the hospital, but um, we're trying to find out what are the mechanisms behind this. And, and uh, the study that, that I referred to, um, nobody, uh, this is something new, nobody has done this kind of study before. Um, there are some in Sweden, there are some in England who are, who are doing uh, similar things like what happens if people see pictures of a, relig a, a religious nature or pictures of a secular nature? Does that help reduce pain? Um, and they're coming to the same results. So, so perhaps this can be of use to us. In other areas that are, are very important for society are um, the relationship or, or the, um, the reasons behind terrorism, political and, uh, uh, and other forms of terrorism, and what kind of what kind of mechanisms are, are behind uh, terrorism. And we know that it's not just the brain that's involved. It's uh, a, a very much a, a social phenomenon, and it's very much a, 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 a group dynamic that's, that's behind it. So we actually have um, cognitive scientists who are studying such things. So in that way, we're trying to contribute to, um, to the greater society. One might also say that, that um, the new way forward is trying to, trying to get people in the human sciences to think um, experimentally, to think in terms of hypotheses and see if this vast, vast body of knowledge that we already have of, of uh, history um, and of culture 
can, can be reformulated so we can test some things. And by being able to test them, we're able to explain them. And if we can find um, explanatory uh, paradigms or frameworks, that might help other people in, in the other sciences and ultimately um, society at large. So this is something that we, we firmly believe in. We're still in the beginning. It's, it's still an upward battle um, trying to get our colleagues to think in this manner. But I think that once they understand what it's about, I think it'll pick up. We need the historians and uh, in the study of religion, we need the biblical scholars to pick up on, on this. And it's already happening. There are people studying the classics, for example, who have, have found that uh, this approach is very, very useful. Um, people doing studies of, of uh, Asian uh, religions in China, for example, um, and uh, people who are doing biblical studies are finding out that this, this might be a way of trying to answer some of those questions that we've been raising. But it's, as I say, there's a, a lot of skepticism. There's a lot of traditionalism. Uh, people, it's hard work. I mean, you, you, you just, you, you have to leave your routines and start new routines. And you have to not be the lone wolf scholar writing his or her book. You have to go into a team of people who are specialists in each their own area, a physicist, a mathematician, a biologist, and, and so forth. Um, and that requires that you um, loosen up, that, that you, of course, keep your core competence and uh, expand it, but you need to be able to communicate with other people from other disciplines and work together, not just talk together, but work together. And, and that's hard, it's very difficult, because often you'll, you're in situations of miscommunication or um, we have our whole research traditions that clash with each other and, and, and things like that. But once you get beyond that, something happens. And here is where um, the, the, the really interesting thing happens. Young people, they are immediately attracted to this kind of situation. And they're brilliant and they're eager and they learn not only their own core competence but also the competences in the other disciplines. And they're producing stuff. They're producing publications that are, that are being accepted in peer-reviewed journals and other disciplines. And this, to me, is a, a sign that, that um, they are growing in competence uh, much more than, than I am, much more than the, the older people who, who started this, this, uh, this movement. And this is what's happening here in Benoit. Um, we have this wonderful collection of young people who are eager and trying out all kinds of different things. Some of them are, might seem strange to uh, traditional uh, humanists, uh, some might seem strange to society at large, but uh, we've seen from our, um, from our results until now that we have something important to say. Uh, it's about religion, and um, we've, we're specialists in religion, and, and together with people who are specialists in the brain and the body and cognition, we're finding out that um, there's a lot more to it than, than we had thought. And it's very, very important, especially in the political situation, the global situation today, that we understand what kind of mechanisms are uh, at play here. And this is where the, the laboratory here in Bono, uh, Lavinia, is, uh, is um, showing the way and uh, has become part of a, uh, of a network of laboratories, um, Aarhus, uh, Belfast, Oxford, uh, Vancouver, um, and uh, I think I think we're going to be seeing some very, very interesting things within the next decade or so.